Vader and Venture 51 and Bullpen, the host of Postseed, purchased 200 books. And hopefully, you picked up the books out there. They finally arrived. And after this interview, Peter will actually be signing some books. So um, of course, you'll be sticking around for that, because that's during lunch. So Peter, congratulations on the books. 100,000 books have been sold already. That's amazing. And you've, you've hit the New York Times bestseller list, Amazon bestseller list, and it's, it's now published in 18 languages. Congratulations. No, we don't have it fully in 18. It's going to, be, going to be in 18 over the next two months. So. Well, congratulations. I, I, I think uh, it's a great job uh, on the book, Get great contribution to the entrepreneurs and to investors. And um, it's a very multidisciplinary book. And, and as, I, as I read it, I thought that, you know, I thought a lot about, um, I've known you now for 15 years, and I thought, this is just, this is Peter. This is his approach to life, to questions, to topics. Um, always very multifaceted. I remember we met when you were the CEO of PayPal, and you were one of the few CEOs I could talk to about not just startups, but about public company valuations, about um, the macro economy, about philosophy. And, and I bring that up because this conversation today will be very broad. We're not just going to talk about seed stage investing, but um, a number of topics. Um, but we'll start with seed stage investing because most people here are probably either investors in the post seed or series A. And a lot of the startups here have probably received their seed and they're, are curious about um, what's happening in you know, the early stages. So 10 years ago, you put, your, you put $500,000 into Facebook, mm -hmm. 2004. A lot has changed in the last decade in, when it comes to seed stage investing. Um, besides the fact that there's more of it, what do you think the biggest changes are in the last decade? decade and is it harder or easier as an investor? Um, well, I would say the, uh, the default is that it's, it's certainly, it certainly seems somewhat harder than a decade ago. I think there are, uh, you know, I, I think the, the good thing is that there are um, more great companies being started now than there were being started a decade ago. I think the, uh, the challenge is that um, there, are, there are more investors competing uh, for, uh, to invest in these opportunities, and there's a sense in which uh, uh, the valuations often of seem seem quite a bit higher. So the you know, the Facebook investment in summer of 2004 was at a five million dollar valuation. Um, it was already at 20 college campuses. They had 100,000 people signed up. Um, they were going to launch to 100 more colleges in the fall. And so uh, if you had those kinds of metrics for a business today, um, I think the the valuation would probably be sort of an order of magnitude higher. Yeah. It'd probably be valued at 50 million or 100 million. So, um, so that would have still been a good investment, but um, but so I think it has become um, it has become quite a bit more challenging. You know, if you if you look at uh, at Y Combinator as sort of a metric, um, you know, 05, 06, uh, you could invest in the companies at Demo Day and Y Combinator at valuations at one and a half to two million dollars, um, and sort of fast forward eight nine years, um, it's again maybe not quite a, a zero more, but it's close, maybe eight to ten x it's of what higher. it was eight years ago. Average seed stage deal would be now, valuation-wise. You know, it's. I think these things are always, you know, a bit of a uh, term. You know, so there's, there's no clear definition between seed and Series A and, and all these things. But uh, but yeah, I think I think uh, I think sort of you 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 can see things anywhere. I mean, you can still see things at three, four million. You can see things at eight million, ten million. There's some you know, where people have experience, they've done it before, um, and you get sort of into you know, high you know, 15, 18 million. For a seed round. If, if it's a repeat entrepreneur, right. there's some reputation. Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm never quite sure um, that valuation, you know, valuation is very important, but, uh, but it's often a mistake to be too price sensitive. So, mm -hmm. uh, so when I've looked at the, the venture investing that uh, and angel and venture investing I've done over the last decade, uh, it's probably the best investments. Um, there have been a few investments where it was just, um, you know, sort of very opportunistic and somehow was actually cheap. And I think Facebook summer of '04 would would count in that category. Uh, but I think um, I think most of it has actually 
been where it was the things that felt expensive that turned out to still be the good investments, and the ones that felt uh, cheap were often just uh, bad companies. And so, um, and so uh, you know, we invested in the Series C round at Facebook, uh, spring of 2006. The valuation was 525 million pre. Um, you know, they were up to 39 million revenues, were still not profitable. That felt, you know, really, really expensive, and that turned out to be the best investment we made, you know, in in uh, in the first uh, in Founders Fund one. And uh, and I think something like that's been been true of a lot of these things. So uh, so um, you 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 want you want always be somewhat sensitive to valuation, but I think it's a much more important variable what the quality of the team or the quality of the idea is. So. You know, seed valuations, maybe they can range by a factor of 10. It could be mm -hmm, 2 million, mm -hmm. it could be 20. Um, but the outcomes at the end of the day, they can vary by a factor of 10,000. And you, know, you were much better off being the 100th employee at Google on customer service than being the, uh, the uh, CEO of the average Series A venture capital funded company in Silicon Valley um, over, the last, uh, over the last decade. And so. So I think one of the things that's always very counterintuitive is, is that there's this incredible power law where uh, when things work, they work far better. And, you know, we're, and uh, it's, it's very different from what we're taught sort of in, in, um, in elementary school or, or high school. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, it may be the case that all, um, you know, all people are created equal. Certainly all companies are not created equal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amount of inequality that exists between companies is I think much greater than people generally understand. I want to touch on something you just said earlier about how it's probably a little bit more challenging today mm -hmm. to be an investor, particularly in the early stages. And what you're seeing now, because there's so many companies and because it's cheaper mm -hmm. to start a company, you're seeing a lot of investors' uh, strategies basically um, following the Ron Conway strategy mm -hmm. of diversification. Google Ventures invests in 80 companies a year. 500 startups is probably at 700, 800 companies already in the last five years. But you actually say that um, you're skeptical of diversification. And, and you say that you're skeptical because investors are treating companies like lottery tickets. So I guess ethically, maybe it's not the right way to invest. But economically, isn't there validity to this uh, diversification strategy, given that it's really tough to, to know who the winners are at the seed stage? Well, um, well, you, you always, you end up, you know, to the extent you invest in more than one company, you end up implicitly diversifying. So obviously I'm not um, saying that you, know, you should put all your eggs in just one basket or, or something, uh, something like that. But I, I do think that, um, I do think there's probably sort of treating it as a portfolio or as a sort of massively diversified strategy um, I tend to think is a bit of a mistake, and uh, it's sort of a mistake on two different levels. I, I certainly don't, I don't like the way you end up interacting with the companies, where if everyone's just a lottery ticket, that sort of creates a somewhat dysfunctional relationship between the investor and the entrepreneur, where you're sort of uh, fundamentally in a very different zone. You want the entrepreneur to take enormous risk, and it's just this tiny, uh, uh, it's not even much of a risk for you at all. So you're sort of very misaligned on that level. But, um, but what I've also found is that when you think of it as a lottery ticket, when you say, well, you know, this might work, it might not work, I don't really know, it's a lottery ticket, um, you've already psyched yourself into losing. And so um, whenever, you know, a lottery ticket multiply a small probability by a big number, mm -hmm. it's normally a zero. It's normally, you know, when you multiply a small number by a big number, it's a small number. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you play the lottery. And, um, and something like that, if you have that sort of attitude, Towards, um, towards investing in uh, startups, uh, the problem is there are far too many lottery tickets you can buy. There are far too many different companies that are, um, that, that, that are out there. And, uh, and so you've sort of talked yourself into not doing, um, not, uh, doing quite as much work. And, um, and what, you know, where, where we've done best over the years is when um, we had sort of a lot of conviction and we were willing to put a lot of money into things. Mm -hmm. And then systematically, the, the points where we had less conviction, invested smaller dollar amounts, those have actually done much worse. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I found that it's always, it's always easy to say, don't really know, I'll just do half. 
I think that's always the temptation that, uh, that one, should, uh, one should resist very strenuously. One, one other version of this um, is that you, know, you have a lot of these uh, seed stage uh, opportunities where you have 10 different people, and it's like maybe they're raising a million dollars and 10 people are investing 100,000 each. Mm -hmm. um, and again, my, my instinct is um, as a default to almost stay away from a company like that because if you have 10 different investors investing, uh, you might say, wow, there are 10 different people who've thought about it, so way more people have diligenced it. Um, but I think in reality what happens far more typically is that each of those people is counting on the other people to do their work. No one's really done any work. And so, um, so I, I, and I suspect that um, you know, it's very hard to get scientific data on this, but if we, if we actually looked at um, uh, sort of deals that had many different investors, I think those typically have underperformed ones in which you had a more limited number because um, even though the naive view would be you have 20 investors, they've, they've had 20 people think about it versus say two investors and you've had two people think about it. And put in more money. And yeah. putting in more money. I think the reality is you have two and they've really thought about it versus 20 and it turns out nobody has. But I think today there's more, uh, I think people are open to that. I mean, over the last five years, people are more open to taking you know, $25,000, $50,000 checks from multiple people, um, you know, having maybe investors, having 15, 20 investors um, putting in $100,000. I, I don't see what is so wrong with, um, you know, getting a hundred thousand dollar check. I mean, you write two hundred fifty thousand well, dollar checks. Well, I, I don't think it's, I don't think there's anything morally wrong with it. And I think people have a, they have a right to invest their money. They have a right to invest their money badly. I think people sort of, um, I think people sort <laughs> of, um, you know, I, I, I certainly don't think that it should be outlawed or anything like that. Um, but, um, but I think, uh, but I think the, the I, again, I'm just sort of describing, I'm describing my own psychology on this. But sure. I, but I think this is actually pretty widespread. Is that. Um, is that um, it, there is no wisdom of crowds. Okay. That when you have a lot, when you have a large crowd of people doing something, you should think no, nobody's really thought for themselves here. Okay, but you wouldn't really hold it against a company if they had ten investors or twenty investors in the in their seed round. You wouldn't look at it and say, oh. I don't. Hold it, I don't, I don't, you would? I'd hold it a little bit against them. Oh, okay. I, I mean, how I mean, many people I, here have more than twenty investors in their company? Well, How 20 many is a lot. startups are here anyway? Let me see. How many of you are lottery tickets? No, I'm kidding. All right. um, there are some out here. I'm not going to point at anyone, but um, let's just say there are startups out here, and a lot of them have received seed funding. Mm -hmm. And I think Duncan had a slide about um, seed investing is up 10x in the last 60 years. And, but now it's fiercely competitive to get you know, even your post seed or your Series A and certainly the big Series A rounds. What's your advice to these startups? On um, getting to on the Series get, A. Getting to the Series A. Getting the later stage rounds. Well, well, one, one um, you know, this, this can always be pushed too far, but certainly uh, one perspective uh, that I have is that um, you should not think of the financing process as that decoupled from everything else. And so, what, uh, what happens in most companies in Silicon Valley is that if things work, you know, you can always raise money at a later stage. Uh, you, um, you, you will, and because we have this boom, you'll typically get an up round. Um, but um, but I, think it's, um, I think it's never quite that automatic. And so in the companies that are doing phenomenally well, I think they're often leaving quite a bit of money on the table. Um, because they're you know, not talking to enough investors or anything like that. And then I think there are a lot at the margins where um, it's sort of, uh, it just uh, doesn't, doesn't, um, it doesn't quite come together at all. And so I would say, you know, the day you close your seed round, you know, like the next day, you're starting the financing process for the Series A. And you should think about, you know, what are the benchmarks? How do we, you know, and, and so first, you know, so you sort of say, well, we're starting the financing process for Series A. What can we tell people today that's different from yesterday, and uh, and how do we how do we uh, how do we go about driving that? And um, and I think I think having that as a you know it shouldn't be the sole focus, but having this as a larger focus than it is mm -hmm. is probably a good way to to discipline things rather than okay I'm glad we're done with the annoying investors we closed the seed money 
now we can work on building the company for a year, and then we'll talk to people a year from now and, 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 and see. I think uh, people would do better if they thought of it as just this continuous process. An ongoing process, An ongoing constantly, process. right? It, it's just building in, especially relationships. Especially businesses that are more capital intensive in one way or another. Right. Let, let, let's turn to your book a little bit and talk about uh, monopolies. Monopolies and, uh, and competition. And you say, and you've said many times uh, publicly that competition is for losers. And I would actually, I actually would agree with that. And, and I think a number of startups would actually agree with that. I see a lot of startups and I speak to startups every day and we talk about what is your you know, go-to-market strategy, I meaning what, what market are you targeting first, but at the same time, in parallel, when they're going after this market, they also need to have a bigger vision about you know, how big the, the opportunity can be. And when you were at PayPal, you, you targeted eBay, the 20,000 eBay uh, super sellers, um, but you had to have a bigger vision that was articulated to VCs. So I guess my question is, do you really think most startups don't think this way? And I think most startups would want to really uh, find a place that's very non-competitive. Well, it's, um, let me, um, yeah, so there's a question how, how, is there anything unorthodox about this idea at all, that you should aim for a monopoly? And so there's obviously some degree to which um, this is very standard business advice. You want to have a moat. You want to be doing something other people are not doing. I do think using the, the M word is, is somewhat helpful. People, um, you know, and I, I do think that, uh, that, um, that, you know, if you're a founder or an entrepreneur or investor, you want a company that's going to be a monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, and you want it to be, uh, you know, so differentiated from the rest of the world that you have, uh, that you have real, real pricing power. Um, and so I do think that's, that's uh, very worthwhile as a, as a focus. Um, in practice, um, people uh, uh, people will uh, will often fudge on this to some extent. So they'll say, "Well, we're somewhat different, and it's somewhat competitive," and um, and and you end up with this this somewhat uh, somewhat of a fudged answer. And uh, and from there, it's very easy to slide into something that's incredibly competitive. And so, um, you know, one of the reasons I mean, one, of the one, one, okay. one of the reasons people don't are uncomfortable with monopoly mm -hmm. is if you have a company that's um, that's aiming for monopoly, there's no one else doing it, and you don't get validation from other people. If you're doing something that's really competitive, there are lots of other people doing it, and um, and that ends up being validating, even though it's a um, it's sort of a it may be a dumb idea. You know, the, the sort of the autobiographical version. This I always tell is. I was, you know, I was hyper tracked as a kid. My, you know, eighth grade, junior high school uh, yearbook. One of my friends said, you know, I know you're going to get into Stanford in four years. I got, went, got into Stanford four years later. I went to Stanford. I went to Stanford Law School. Good grades. Ended up at a top uh, New York law firm. You know, from the outside, it was a place everybody wanted to get in. On the inside, it was a place everyone wanted to get out. You know, I left um, uh, after seven months, three days. When I left, um, one of the people down the hall from me said, you know, I didn't know it was possible to escape from Alcatraz. And you say, well, all you have to do is go out the front door and not come back. But, um, but people's sense of identity was so wrapped up in who they were competing and who they were beating that, um, that uh, that's what people thought was valuable. That's what they thought was, uh, was meaningful. You know, there's the Kissinger line on academia, a uh, Henry Kissinger line, that the battles are so ferocious because the stakes are so small. And you always think, well, that's just a description of the insanity of professors or something. But um, you know, why would that be? If the stakes are so small, why would the battles be so ferocious? And um, it's not just a for definition of insanity, it's also just the logic of the situation. If, if the, you are no different from somebody else, the battles will be much more ferocious. The smaller the differences, the more ferocious the battles. And, um, and I do think there's this deeply psychological thing where we, we sort of get attracted to, uh, to this stuff. Is that you know, the mimetic theory? It's mimetic, it's, it's, uh, but if, you're, if you want to compete like crazy, you should open a restaurant in San Francisco. And you, you'd say, well, obviously, that's such a dumb idea. Um, and obviously, therefore, nobody's opening restaurants in San Francisco. And, um, and that's not quite true. And what instead happens is people open restaurants, and then they tell a fictional story of why it's not really competitive. And so it's, OK, this will be the only British Nepalese fusion cuisine in the marina. 
um, and it's going to be um, it's going to be uh, nice, but not too expensive, and it'll be really hip. Um, Peter, wait one second. And Didn't you open up a restaurant once? I I, I learned a lot from that, but um, <laughs> but um, but I think I think so. I think there's always a fictional story on this, and so so um, so yes. So um, so I, I would say the you know um, the monopoly theme is. You know, it's, it's a super important starting point. It's much easier said than done. And so there are all these pitfalls where people will have all sorts of fictional stories of you know, why they're differentiated, why they're unique. Like every Hollywood movie that gets made, it's a fictional story. It's OK. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a, some hackers that are um, teaming up to track down the shark that killed their friend. So it's a combination of Jaws and some hacker movie, it's never been done before. So there's always a fictional account of why it's one of a kind. The reality is it's just a movie. The reality is the Nepalese British fusion cuisine restaurant is just a restaurant. And so, um, so I think um, parsing through the fiction is important. Now, there have been, you know, there've been important categories where people, um, I think, did not do this. So the, you know, the clean tech um, debacle of the, of the last decade, um, every single PowerPoint presentation that you saw it started with, um, you know, we are in this giant market. It's called energy. It's in the hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And that, so that certainly suggested, okay, you're a minnow in a vast ocean. Um, doesn't matter whether it's a red ocean or a blue ocean. It's always a red ocean. You don't know, you know, you don't know what else you're up against. That's not a place you want to be. So mm -hmm. I think, I think, um, so I think you do want to have some story about how you're going after small markets, taking those over, then building out in concentric circles. There's always the risk the story is fictional, but uh, you should try not to lie to yourself. You know, I, I agree. I don't like when people say things like, I'm the Uber of this, or I'm the Airbnb of this. I try to tell them, you need to change your story. Something of somewhere but, is the nothing of nowhere. It's like the Stanford of North Dakota. Exactly. <laughs> the, uh, but you did mention validation. And so, and here's the challenge for people who have really unique ideas. Um, you have to really change behavior. When you have something totally new, something that nobody agrees with, you can spend a lot of time trying to educate people. So my question is, how do you come up with something very unique and not waste money, overspend, um, you know, trying to educate them? Well, it's, it's, look, it's certainly not sufficient for it to be just some weird outlier different idea. I mean, it's, it's always, you know, it's always, it's not, you know, it's not just contrarian or unique. It's also that it makes sense and, or it's true or, or some, something like that. And, and so it is always, um, you know, it's always the, the combination of these things. But yeah, I think, I think it is, um, it is at least somewhat more difficult for something that's, uh, that's new than for something that is, you know, Stanford of North Dakota, very easy to describe mm -hmm. what that is. Um, and so I, I would say again, as a as a um, you know investor, entrepreneur, um, you know people often ask me this question: What are trends that I see in technology? What are things that I see happening? I'm always, I always dislike the question because you know I have no idea what the future holds and on that on that sort of a level. But um, but I, I would say systematically that I am skeptical of all trends. And so I think every single trend that you can name is overrated. Um, you know, enter, um, you know, educational software, healthcare IT software, SaaS, really overrated. If you hear the words cloud computing, big data, machine learning, you know, you should just think fraud. You should be running away from that as fast as you possibly can. And, and it's, not, it's not that there isn't such a thing as trying to make sense of lots of data or, you know, uh, co uh, computing moving into the cloud. It's when people default to buzzwords like that, they are, um, they are um, they're sort of putting themselves in these broad categories and they're obscuring everything that's, uh, that's truly uh, essential and unique and ultimately valuable. And so I think the, I think the, 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 um, the, 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 the undervalued companies um, are the ones that somehow, where the narrative is harder, it doesn't easily fit into these buzzwords, but, uh, uh, but then that's the challenge you have as a founder is to, is to figure out some way to articulate it. What, what are you investing in that doesn't fall into those buzzwords? Well, um, well I would say that, you know, I would say that, um, you know, all the... All so you the, need a buzzword. No, no, no. Well, well I would say all the, 
all the major companies that um, we've invested in over the years, there's, there certainly is a description, but it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's, you know, Elon SpaceX is a, is a rocket, you know, it's, it's a new rocket company, but it's, it's again, it's, there's all sorts of reasons you can get to very quickly why it is one of a kind. Or there are companies where you have buzzwords, but I'm skeptical of them. So you could say uh, people lump Airbnb in as part of the sharing economy, mm. but I do don't Do you think like that's, the sharing economy? I don't, I don't think it's quite the right category. You know, it's, okay. it's, no, it's actually just, you know, it's, it's, it's this, it's this um, hotel um, tourism uh, type of a- Do you like marketplaces? Do you like that? Is that mar a buzzword? Marketplace is another bad, oh, that's a really bad buzzword. <laughs> platforms, <laughs> be scared of platforms, all those things are, are bad, but, but, but you, know, you, you do occasionally have companies where um, they sound like they're just part of a, of a category um, and th what's unique is hidden and those can be very valuable. So you know, there have been a lot of social networking sites b before Facebook mm. and, um, and I would say um, that uh, the key thing was Facebook was actually the first one to crack real identity or there had been a lot of search engines before Google and so if you said, well, I'm not gonna invest in a search engine because we've had that before, that would have been a mistake and what was key was uh, Google was the first one with uh, machine-powered search with a PageRank algorithm. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so I do think um, I do think uh, uh, we often do, um, we tend to sort of default to these uh, buzzword-like categories. Um, in general, you should be very leery of categories, but there are occasionally uh, also great companies that are hidden where they sound like they're in a category, but they're really not. So you use a, a, a larger, bigger descriptive to, to well, call you have your to, company. You have to always, Don't. you have to think through it in every case. Got there's it. no, there's no, no process sh shortcut. What? How much time do we have? Because I want to mention to everyone that um, we're going to leave 30 minutes for Q and A. So the, the mics are here. So when you're ready, how much time do we have before Q and A? Only three minutes. Okay, and then 30 minutes for. Okay, so let's let's move on to bubbles. Um, you say we're not in a bubble because it's a psychosocial phenomenon. I, I agree, we're definitely not in the bubble. You and I have been around since 1999, 2000, 250 companies going public. I agree there's no tech bubble, but, but um, do you think that there could be an impending bubble in the private sector now that all these would-be public investors are going into the private markets to, to realize some of the value that's being captured in the private markets, private sector? Um, you know, well, I, I'll stick with my, my, my categorical thing that uh, you only get a bub bubble when the public's involved, and by definition, the public's not involved in the, in the private sector. It's possible the valuations can be higher or lower, so, you know, it, it could be that valuations are, you know, full or, or something like that. But I, I don't think, um, I think we're, we're nowhere near the uh, 99, 2000, no. um, 2000 insanity. And I, I would say the, you know, um, if you had to say where there is a bubble today, it's probably, it's probably government bonds, it's fixed income. Um, and, um, and I sort of have this history of this stuff where you know, in the 90s, uh, the lie was growth rates and cash flows and the bubble was called the new economy. In the 2000s, the lie centered on the uh, risk premium of assets, and the lie was called the great moderation. And by system of elimination, the only uh, financial variable you can lie about that's left, we've lied about growth rates and cash flows and risk premia, the only lie that's left are the risk-free rates, which are negative. Mm -hmm. And the, the claim that they will stay forever negative is called the secular stagnation, which I think is, is, is it doesn't sound like a bullish lie, but that, that's sort of what it is. And, um, and so if the main thing that um, is, 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 is weirdly distorted in our economy is the minus 2% real interest rates, then the things you want to be careful of are bonds or bond-like assets. So you don't want to be in bonds, you don't want to be in corporate bonds, you don't want to be in stocks that look like bonds, stocks that have large dividends, uh, large cash flows that people model um, like, uh, like bonds. Um, most of the growth tech stocks are completely different, so it doesn't matter what the interest rates are. You know, if you're investing in a startup company, the only variable that matters is, will the growth happen? I, I was actually saying that, are, are we seeing a bubble right now in the private markets? What I was saying was an impending bubble, and do you have fears of that, particularly with the Jobs Act opening up the private markets to you know, the I, masses? It's, it's, I, the, um, I don't think that much money is flowing over. 
uh, still at the margin. Yeah. So it's, 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 if you look at the amount of money going to venture capital firm <laughs> funds, you know, it's, it's still not that much more than it was a few years ago. There's definitely some crossover investing by Fidelity and people like that at very late stages. On the other hand, companies are staying private for much longer, and so there is probably more need for, for private capital. Uh, there may be a little bit more at the seed stage. There may be a little bit more at the very late stage. But, um, but I think it's, um, it's sort of one of the last places money is going to. You know, I think there are, I think there are very few, you know, even if you look at um, people who, who uh, made a lot of money at uh, these tech companies like Google or Facebook, um, almost none of them are spending most of their money on tech investing. I mean, most of the money is being spent on houses. Mm -hmm. So, so um, it's, it's still the case that if you made, you know, if you made, um, if you made $10 million at Facebook, um, um, I haven't, I, again, I haven't done a scientific study on this, but I would guess that 90% of the people who've made that sort of money, way more is being spent on a house than on investing in seed stage startups. And so we should be much more worried, is there you know, a mini housing bubble in Silicon Valley than is, are, is too much money being spent on, um, on early stage startups? No one's gonna go broke because they put all their money in seed uh, investing in startups yeah. because no one's doing that. Yeah, I mean. I mean, like is, is anybody in this room investing 100% of their capital in seed stage companies? But they can't live in these companies. All right, all right. Oh, we have one person. <laughs> okay, I stand slightly corrected. Okay, there's one company that you, I do think you think is a bubble, at least bubble valuation, so that's Uber, I'm, I'm assuming. So, um, and now I think it's going to be valued at $40 billion, but I'm not going to ask you whether it's overvalued or not, uh, because you've said you think it's overvalued. I'm going to ask you about the logic around why it is. And you've said that it's because of eroding profits, it's competing a lot with Lyft, um, but yet at the same time you use the same logic um, with Airbnb, which I believe does have a competitor in HomeAway. In fact, HomeAway probably does, I think it's gonna generate about 400 million in revenue this year, which is still maybe more than Airbnb, I, I don't know. But by using that same logic, then I would, wouldn't you say Airbnb is also overvalued? Um, yeah, so full disclosure, I'm you know, extremely biased on this question since uh, we're investors in Lyft, and, um, and so we, uh, we, uh, you know, and I'm on record as saying that I think Uber is the most ethically challenged company in Silicon Valley, and I'm, I'm willing to repeat that every single time I, I'm at one of these events. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. but, I, but if you, um, let's, let's just drill down on the, uh, let's drill down on, say, Uber versus Airbnb as, a, as, a, um, as an analysis. And so uh, the question is, and I think it's always a granular question. So, you, you know, yes, there's this big, big market for cars. There's this big market for, you know, short-term places to, to stay. Um, but I think you always have to look at it on a more granular basis. And so if you have a company like Uber with 500 cars in San Francisco competing with a company like Lyft with 50 cars, because um, that's sort of one dynamic. Now, let's say you have a company like Airbnb with 500 places to stay in San Francisco competing with the second one with 50. And it's not really home away because home away is more vacation home. So there's, there's mm -hmm. a urban versus non-urban thing. So I think um, there's not even a second one that has 50 homes in San Francisco that you could, you could go to. But, um, but what's very different is cars are basically interchangeable. Places to stay are not. So okay, so I'd like to stay in San Francisco. I'd like to stay somewhere in the marina. That's not 500, that's 25 places are in the marina. Then I have a certain price range. I'm down to 10, then I want a place that lets me have a dog, I'm down to one. Okay, mm -hmm. so the 500, um, uh, the, the, the one that has 500 homes um, will have a unique value proposition and then you're not even gonna go to the site with 50 mm -hmm. on it because chances are there will not be a place in your price range that will allow you to have a dog for a week in the marina. Now, um, with, if you compare that with something like Uber versus Lyft, it's all just cars and, um, and people, you know, arguably don't care that much about one car versus another. And so I would, I, I would say that the, uh, the competitive dynamics are, are way more intense. And so, so if, if, you, um, if you asked me, you know, if, if it was a long short trade, Airbnb at 13 billion versus Uber at 40 billion, uh, I would think it's really clear you want to be long Airbnb, short, uh, short Uber. Probably, you probably would want to do that even if they were valued equally. But I think there, there's a massive, relative misvaluation. 
Um, I'm again tempted to come up with psychological explanations for this. The, uh, the, um, the most, uh, you know, one sort of standard psychological blind spot investors have is that they like things that they themselves use. Mm -hmm. And so investors will be biased towards Uber because they like driving black town cars. They're gonna be biased against Airbnb because uh, you don't like uh, sleeping on people's couches. All right, well, I'm not gonna belabor this, but at one point, so Lyft, though, is definitely undervalued in your, in your book. Um, it's it's cer certainly, um, certainly relative to, uh, you know, I, I'm not gonna comment on that precisely, but I, I think relative to, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, the relative share relative to Uber, you have to okay. assume it's gonna get wiped out, it's not clear it's gonna happen. I wanna move into the education bubble, but really quickly, I wanna just, your quick thoughts on LinkedIn and Twitter, both have a valuation of 28 billion. Which company will hit 50 billion first? You know, I'm, I don't have as I don't have as, have as good a view on the uh, on these uh, on these um, on these sort of much better established public market companies. There's there's a degree to which you know an awful lot of information is in the um, is in the uh, in the public um, markets. Uh, you know, I got uh, one of the things I got in a lot of trouble on this book tour. On they're always trying to sort of get you to say controversial things. So I was on the CNBC program for about three hours in the morning. It was a squawk box show in New York. And towards the end of the show, we were sort of talking about Twitter. And um, um, I, they sort of got on me, yeah, you know, I, um, um, yeah, there's probably a lot of pot smoking go going on over there. Um, you know, as I, as I left the TV studio, the CEO of CNBC came up, was smiling, was like, you did a great job, Peter. We'd love to have you back anytime you want to be back here. I said, wow, I got really said too much. Um, uh, Dick Costolo tweeted uh, back in, in very good form that, you know, uh, that um, he had no time to comment on it since he was busy eating a large bag of Doritos. <laughs> um, um, and, but now again, you know, these things always get taken out of context. So let me, you know, the, the larger so, context. Were you of, bullish on Twitter? It was a, it was a pro Twitter comment, yes. Um, and the, 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 the larger context was that um, Twitter, um, you know, that you know, if you have a monopoly, if you have a company that's doing something that nobody else can copy, you can screw up everything else. Mm -hmm. It can be horribly mismanaged. Um, you could even have a lot of pot smoking going on. It doesn't actually matter. Um, and, so, um, and so I think that if I had a sort of, so it's a d bit of an apples and oranges comparison. I think LinkedIn is much better managed than Twitter. Um, um, and so it's, it's fun, the fundamental question on Twitter is, you know, do they get their act together? But they have a, there's a huge franchise value there. Does Dick know that you think that LinkedIn is better managed well, than no, no, Twitter? I'm on, I'm on record as saying that I think, you know, I think Twitter is better managed now than it was a few years ago. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, uh, the, it's I, think, I think a lot of, look, I, I think one of the down, there's something about software where it has led to a lot of monopoly-like businesses. This is why software has been such a good place to invest. This is why many other areas of technology have not been good places to invest because they don't naturally lead to, Monopolies. You can invest in disk drive manufacturing in the 1980s. You come with a disk drive that was better than anybody else in the world, and, you, and 18 months later, someone else would come up with a better one. And uh, 10 years later, disk drives were massively improved, but the net, net of it was none of the founders, investors, entrepreneurs involved in disk drive manufacturing companies made money. It was a public good, but it was not, it was not a good investment. Software is a very unusual category because it's one where the inventors have actually captured some of the value of what they create. I mean, the history of innovation for the last 250 years is that most of the time, the inventors, the creators, the founders of these companies end up with almost nothing. Um, and, uh, and, and so there is something really unusual about, uh, about software. The, the sort of the, the downside or the, the, one, the one minus to it is that, um, is that you know, in Silicon Valley, we have, um, the companies are, generally not well run. Um, and they're, you know, if you had to sort of rank how well these companies are managed, it's somewhere from really bad to sort of maybe a little bit above mediocre on some absolute, on some absolute spectrum. And it, um, it doesn't matter that much because the business models work as well as they do. If you're, if you're, you know, the restaurants in San Francisco, the management is from mediocre to outstanding. You have to, I mean, you, if you're running a restaurant, you have to do everything just about perfectly and maybe you get to stay in business. Maybe there's something to be said about competition. It's, they're competing and so they're getting to be kind the, the, better the, managers. When, whenever you compete, you get better at that which you're competing on. And so it, yes, they, um, they're operationally uh, far more efficient. 
um, but they made the, uh, the big mistake of going into the wrong thing. So there's a lot of stuff. We have retail sanity, wholesale madness. The, retail, the details they get right, the big picture, opening a restaurant, catastrophic mistake. You touched on innovation, and so I definitely want to talk about technological stagnation because you've, you've mentioned that before, that over the last 45 years, that's, that's basically what we're seeing, technological stagnation. But, but just, you know, I want to first finish our conversation about bubbles. And, and by the way, does anyone have a question for him? I don't want to m monopolize this conversation. Okay. Oh, go ahead. My question is... <clears throat> Is it working? Yeah. My question is regarding the, the idea of monopolies. So normally, historically, monopolies were de jure monopolies. It was like some sort of government granted license. Whereas historically in tech, someone's been able to create a platform. They've rode that way for about, say, five, 10 years, create an ecosystem around it. And then something very disruptive comes out, uh, oftentimes at the peak of what seems like market dominance. And then a couple of years later, either those companies are history or they're, they're uh, fatally wound, wounded, and so how does that play with the idea? So like, Big Blue, when you know the antitrust authorities went after it, Big Blue was actually in secular decline. I would argue that Google right now is in trouble with the uh, with the increase in mobile and people searching less, and all the apps are siloed. So it seems like it's the market peak of of Google, but I would argue that it's in secular decline, at least in markets where mobile has really taken off. Uh, and then, of course, there's contestable markets. I mean, it's a browser search away. There's other search engines like Yandex who are just waiting for Google to have a, a hiccup or two, uh, release a wrong algorithm. And then, you know, right now, mighty Google can just disappear like Nokia did or BlackBerry did. Uh, what are your thoughts there? So, like, I think they're, they're market dominance right now, but they're only as dominant until someone in a garage or some other company pivots, and they could be history in a couple of years. Yes, yeah, so I, don't, I don't think. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't think the monopolies in general are permanent. So as long as there is continuous innovation and in technology, there is always a risk that the monopoly gets replaced or uh, loses power over time. Uh, certainly, as a, so as a, so, it would be unrealistic to to say I'm only going to invest in companies that have permanent monopolies uh, I, because I, I I agree with you that I think those don't exist. I think if you have a 10 or 20 or 30 year run, that's still pretty good. Now, I think most, most of the time, uh, most of the companies that you look at, they, they go straight to the restaurant. And so uh, where it's, it's like there's no monopoly ever, you never make money, and you just lose the money pretty quickly. Um, and so much rather invest in a, in a Google than that, even if, even if it's not uh, something, something, uh, something permanent. I also agree with you that, the, uh, that I think the government regulators have typically gotten it wrong, where the antitrust concerns seem to rise at the precise moment where the monopoly is naturally starting to fade, which was certainly true with IBM in the late 70s, where things were shifting uh, uh, to software. Um, and I, I think this was also true of Microsoft in the late 90s, where things were shifting to the internet. Now, you can argue that it was because I mean, there are different causal stories people can tell, but I think, I think it would have happened even had there been no antitrust uh, action against Microsoft. And, um, and so, even though I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic on where Google is on this on the cycle, if I had to if I had to make the anti-Google argument, um, it would be that uh, the European antitrust regulators are starting to move pretty hard against Google. And since the government always seems to time it incorrectly, I would take that as evidence that uh, that it's actually just at the point where the monopoly is starting to fade. As a follow-on, do you think a paranoid entrepreneur founder is? the best determinant of some of these companies that succeed. Like Facebook, I, I see the purchase of WhatsApp and Instagram as both defensive moves. One was for photographs, where they could potentially build a social network around photographs, so might as well partner up with Instagram and absorb it. WhatsApp, there's been evidence in, especially Asia and other markets, where they've turned it into a social network and actually a platform for even like ordering your Uber and other goods and services. Yeah, I can't, I'm on board of Facebook, so I can't. I have to be careful about what I, what I say there. I, I would say, I would say the founders do set a, a lot of the character of these companies over time, um, and uh, and so uh, and so I don't think, um, and so I, I do think that you know, and I, I think the um, there are, there are pluses and minuses uh, with founders versus professional CEOs. The founders tend to be more difficult personalities. They tend to be somewhat more extreme. 
Uh, I think it is better if you need to innovate. Um, it's, it's, it's probably okay to have a professional CEO once um, you're just um, you know, turning the crank on something. Um, you know, uh, the, um, I, I think Apple is the classic sort of founder-led uh, company where you know, the 1985 when they replaced Jobs with Scully, uh, the, the internal view was home computers were, uh, were finished, there was gonna be no more innovation in home computers. It was just like selling Pepsi. The, the form factor was fully done. It was just a marketing play. Um, and I think that was, um, you know, I think that was a big, that was a big uh, mistake in retrospect. You went through five professional CEOs, and then finally Jobs comes back in '97, and then reinvents the business from home computers to uh, to consumer electronics. Um, you know, the the uh, but then the, there may be points where it's very different. So you could say that uh, 2011, when when Jobs passes away at Apple, um, you know, certainly the uh, the pessimistic version would have been. Wow, Apple is finished. There's going to be no more innovation at all, um, and um, and it's actually done extremely well the last three and a half years. And sort of one you know one contrarian cut I would have on it is is perhaps um, perhaps um, um, the form factor for smartphones in 2011 um, is actually where uh, people thought the form factor for home computers was in 1985. Maybe it's largely done. And therefore, if you have a lead in terms of brand or certain economies of scale, um, that can actually be maintained and scaled. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, it, it sort of gets misdiagnosed in all these ways. Um, so with the talk of a bubble, uh, and it just seems like there's fear and uncertainty around that, do you think that it's, a, that it's more appropriate to categorize that as fear and uncertainty um, about the unsustainability of the current, like the current state of either valuations or investments. I mean, you've spoken out uh, essentially against the shotgun model. Um, do you feel like people are getting the sense that things are unsustainable in their current model, in the current way of financing? I mean, that's kind of part of the conference. Um, or do you think that they're really actually worried about a bubble? Yeah, it's, well, there's, there's probably a lot of, I don't, it's, it's hard to generalize and so I, I, I suspect there's a lot of general free-floating anxiety around, um, and I think it's, it's somewhat justified since we've had a whole series of crazy bubbles. We had a tech bubble in the 90s, we had a housing bubble in the last decade, um, and, um, and so there is, it's a very natural question to ask, you know, are we in another bubble? If so, where is it? And then you have a long list of possible candidates where that could be. So I, I actually, you know, Given, given the history of bubbles over the recent decades, I, I actually do think um, it's a very reasonable default to say that there is a bubble somewhere, and, um, and so you, you, it's a cause for some anxiety. Where it is is much more debatable. I'll get to you, but this is such a good segue. Thank you for bringing up bubbles, by the way. So speaking of bubbles, the education system is a bubble. And Peter, if you haven't read, has likened it to the Catholic Church circa 1500s because it's, quote, becoming a very corrupt institution, leading people to believe that salvation involves getting a college diploma. And so the similarity here is that it's, it's corrupt and a reformation is coming. So many of us know what the reformation was all about. It was the split between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, Protestant worldview. So, but that schism was driven largely by one man, Martin Luther. So I've already mentioned this to Peter before, teed him up because I wanna know who is Martin Luther today who will drive this change and burst this education bubble? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't actually know if it's, I'm like, I, I don't wanna push the analogy that, that <laughs> far, you know? I, um, <laughs> I think that, uh, I think, I, I would say the, um, the, the main uh, points of the analogy is, yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a uniform, unitary institution. Uh, you know, um, you get a diploma or you get a degree from college or you go to hell. You know, um, it's sort of all these analogies. The costs keep going up. There's a certain amount of corruption. Um, what, I, what I do think, what I find very implausible is the idea that there's any reform from within. You know, maybe that happens, you know, a long time from now. You know, um, but I think, um, I think uh, when institutions get to a certain point of corruption, where you, know, you have a trillion dollars of student loans, that to a first approximation have paid for a trillion dollars worth of lies, 
about how good education is. Um, you're dealing with incredibly corrupt institutions at the core. Um, this is, by the way, one of the reasons I'm actually somewhat skeptical of a lot of the um, education software companies people are uh, trying to build because um, they're predicated on working with these institutions. And so, um, hmm. and so, you know, whenever you have something that's a little bit broken, you can envision building something that works, that fixes it, that improves things. When things are incredibly broken, um, you know, it's, uh, it's very ambiguous. It could be, mean that there's room for massive improvement, but it could also mean that uh, there's just massive resistance to, uh, to any, any sort of change. And so I think, I think the fundamental analogy I would say is that, um, you know, the, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the, the reform will come from outside the system. And, um, and the, the message that, you know, and then the, the question people always have is, well, what does the next education system look like? What will, what will it be? And, and I think, um, like, um, like what happened with the Catholic Church post-1500, I think it will not be unitary. So I don't think there is going to be a single new institution that will replace it. And this is, this is of course, was the disturbing message of the, in the 16th century was um, the institution wasn't going to save you. You had to figure out how to save yourself. And in a similar way, there's no educational institution that will, uh, that will save you. Um, young people have to figure it out on their own, and that is the last thing anybody wants to hear. Accelerators and incubators sometimes often liken themselves to the universities. There's Draper University for entrepreneurs. How do they fit in the landscape? Well, I think, I, think, I think the future will have many different approaches. So I think, yeah, I think it will be much more heterogeneous. And so I think all these things are, you know, are some, of, some, of the, some of the ways that you know, you're going you're gonna to have Code Academy, you're going to have to find accelerated ways to learn skills that actually matter. There's going to be all sorts of stuff like this, I think. Do we have one? Oh, go ahead. Hi, so uh, my name is Emily Baum. I'm a startup founder. And I wanted to ask you a question about the buzzwords. Um, you talked about avoiding them running, and I, I totally agree. And as a founder of a company that struggles to find a buzzword I fit into, I'm wondering how you find companies that have a more difficult narrative to tell um, and what advice you'd give to people. Most of the things that are out there are really great if you fit nicely into one of these buzz categories. But how do you reach out? How do you find the people if you don't have that simple narrative? So I, I um, let me flip this around. I, I, w I wouldn't, you know, you know, I, I think it's, at the end of the day, it's primarily not about the narrative. It's primarily about what is it that you're substantively doing. Now, if what it is that you're subst substantively doing can easily fit into a buzzword-like narrative, chances are that it's poorly differentiated. And so, even though it's easy to tell your story, it's likely to be a bad investment or, you know, ultimately not that successful as a company. Um, and so, so I think the, I think what you want to, always have is something that's substantively differentiated. And then it is admittedly you know, a challenge to figure out how to um, you know, explain it to people and how to get the narrative right. But, uh, but still, 80% you know, of it is getting the substantive part right. And then the hope is that you know, there would be some way to come up with, you know, with, with, with a narrative that works. you be somewhat dismissive of SASs, and the reason I thought is we've seen, I've seen, I'm, a, uh, I'm Peter Cowan, I'm an investor and advisor to a number of companies, and I'm very excited by what I'm seeing kind of as a renaissance today of a lot of SaaS applications and capabilities that are enabling companies to start by outsourcing non-key issues, get started up and running, and a lot of these SASs then, as they evolve and people use them, they're using them at more and more levels that in a sense become more dependent on them and they're paying a recurring fee, which is attractive to the company, and further enabling talented people with one or two key skills to grow more. So I'm seeing as an integral part of what's growing and the right sort of companies to have the skills or the capabilities to enable people to grow. Uh, what's your reservation about SaaS's, not as a whole group, but aren't there some terrific ones? Well, it's, uh, so it's again, it's, it's, again, it was more on the level of the, the rhetoric. So it's, if someone describes it just as a SaaS business, that's cause for, that, that's, that sounds like a buzzword, that's cause for skepticism. And then there's always a granular question, you know, is this a unique vertical that no one else has gone after? Um, you know, the, uh, probably the more vertical part of SaaS is better than the horizontal part because, you know, the horizontal part has this more fungible sense. The ver there probably are a number of interesting verticals that people have, um, have not yet done. But I think, uh, again, I think uh, the, 
the, um, the true narrative, the true account of those companies is not, you know, it's this SaaS company, it's, it's actually, you know, it's the software that's for this one very specific application. And then I would try to tell the story in those terms rather than in terms of this abstract SaaS category. One, I think one, last one. Great. Ryan Tarzi, I'm the founder of Playful B. Uh, we at Playful B believe that learning starts at birth. Our contrarian view is all the, all the money right now in ed tech's going into K through 12, those existing institutions you talk about, whereas the most important time is zero to five. What do you think we should be doing for our zero to five-year-olds to prepare them for the future world? Um, let's see. Well, uh, there's, there's, probably, there's probably a lot that, um, that one could do. I, I, um, I there's a lot of different thoughts on the education side. I, I would say one of the challenges for zero to five or K through 12 is that it's all distorted because people are not being prepared for the future world. They're being prepared for college. And so, um, so zero to five, um, the temptation would be you take your bearings for helping people get into kindergarten, helping the kids get into kindergarten. Um, you know, K through 12, um, you're evaluated by whether you're able to get into the right colleges. Um, and that's probably, you know, that's probably the single biggest distortion. I, I don't know, you know, how easy it is to fix that because, um, because that is in fact still where the mindset is. You know, the education bubble isn't going to end anytime soon because people are too scared. They, have, they don't see any alternatives or anything like this. I, I would say one, um, one general thing to say about, um, you know, it, one, of the, you know, one of the things that makes education a bubble, and one of the things that's characteristic of many of these bubbles is they involve incredible abstractions. And so education itself is an abstraction. And so it's worth asking, um, you know, is education, is it an investment where you're investing in the future? Is it a consumption decision where it's um, a four-year party in college or it's just a fun game you're playing? Um, is, it, um, is it an insurance policy to avoid falling through the really big cracks in our society? Or is it a tournament, a zero-sum tournament where you're trying to beat everybody else? Um, and, uh, and I think it's, you know, so it's sort of worth thinking about, uh, even though these are still somewhat abstract categories, I think it's helpful to always think of you know, is your company, is it, is, it, is it an investment, consumption, insurance policy, or tournament company as far as education goes? And then how do you frame it within those? So I'd, 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 I'd start by parsing it into those four subcategories. Okay, I have so many more questions, but obviously we can't keep going on. I mean, Peter, we could go on for hours, I'm sure. But remember, book signing. We have, uh, we have 200 books, and I'm sure Peter's going to... Uh, we're twist his arm to sign a couple for us. I appreciate your time, and I, I, I must say, uh, it's a real pleasure to have him here and to end the question on an education topic. Peter really is one of the most important thinkers, I think, in the United States on this education problem. I mean, everything with Facebook and all the money he's made is great, but his thinking on education is just really, really spectacular. I appreciate he, your time. He is the Martin Luther. Yeah. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't take the bait. Uh, <laughs>